Welcome to the Christadelphian Video Facebook. My name is Ron and I'm speaking from Australia. Our topic for today is why we believe the Bible. And you'll see there from the quotation on the screen that in the book of Acts chapter 17 verse 11 and 12, the apostles came to some people in Thessalonica, which was a city in what we call Greece today. And the record says about them that they examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were so and having examined the scriptures many of them believed and we do believe the bible and that's why we're speaking to you today about why we believe the bible the bible is very clear about the need for faith faith it can be translated in the english as belief and we need to have faith for everyone who was born of god overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it, is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And we need to have faith in the sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he came to do. But we get that faith from the Bible. So what we want to do is just briefly outline to you the, the chiefly the four facts why we believe the Bible is the word of God and can be trusted. We're going to look a little bit about some of the facts about our universe, the amazing planet and the beautiful things that have been made as an evidence that there is a God. Then look at some of the things that show us how accurate the Bible is. For a book of its age, it is remarkably accurate. And we can mention Bible prophecy. We won't have time to go into that today, but we'll say the fact that it's a witness of Bible prophecy, that things that God said would happen, have happened. And then fourthly, the important resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, which are reasons that we go to the Bible for the source of our faith. Let's go first to the earth and the universe in which we live. We live on a remarkably uh, fitted planet for life, and the scientists are now telling us that there's about 122 factors so far identified that make life on this planet possible. A variation in any of them just of a slight degree would actually mean that life would disappear. So we have a perfectly balanced planet to preserve life with a water cycle, um, the correct amount of sunlight, and so many other things, the oxygen and the, and the different gases that we have here in their right proportions, that life can actually exist on this planet. Just for an example of that, every day we have plants that convert sunlight into energy six times more than the entire power consumption that we see in the world today which of course is quite extreme in itself so we have a very remarkable planet and it just shows you that the earth we're upon was created for life and once we look at that as a fact we have to say why are we here why is there life on this planet is it just pure random chance or is there a reason is there a purpose is there a creator just some more facts about the Earth. The Earth is exactly the right distance from the Sun and the correct size uh, and has a vital circular orbit. It rotates at exactly the correct speed for life to exist and prosper. It has a molten magnetic core that is vital to its existence. It has the correct balance of gases, oxygen, hydrogen and water, which is not found on any other planet so far. It has an ozone layer that protects the people that live here from the sun's harmful killer rays it has a large moon which is exactly located to cause the essential gravity and the tidal movements that we see upon earth the earth's tilted axis brings the seasons in turn and the gravity of jupiter drags many of the random comets away from the earth and so we have a, a universe that is constructed to create this one planet upon which life can flourish so quite some amazing facts about the fact that we are here and that things seem to be incredibly well balanced and designed when you come to the created things themselves we find just one example among many that we could go to um, what an amazing creatures inhabit this earth not only the creatures but the plants that they support and the plants which support them when you come to a little hummingbird which is not a very large bird its wings beat at 70 times a second, and there are, there are different varieties of hummingbird, but that's the basic average for a hummingbird. And as humans, if we try to move one of our fingers at even 10 times a second, we couldn't do it. 
these little creatures can move their wings and that just shows an incredible design they're incredibly light they can hover in any direction or remain motionless so that they can extract the the uh, things from the plants that they want they take pollen to other blossoms and cross fertilize and they also have a, a great part in the ecology as they go about their feeding and we need to ask the question how could such an incredibly perfect little creature which is one of many millions of examples have evolved just by pure random chance when you come to the human eye which is something we're all familiar with we have a most incredible thing and we won't go into the detail but it's made up of, of hundreds of different parts all of them have to work together all of them have to be equally existent to, to be any use to each other and then they are joined to the brain by millions of individual little nerves that take the information to the brain and translate it into what we see as sight and it does it so quickly that we can actually track a moving ball uh, and the calculations and the adjustments between the re reception of the light and the recognition of the brain uh, it just shows you the most incredible complexity in creation and everything working together perfectly designed so much so that Charles Darwin who came up with the theory of evolution um, said this the eye with all its inimitable contrivances could have been formed by natural selection seems I freely confess absurd in the highest degree so even Charles Darwin had to say about the human eye that it was impossible to think that this just happened by chance so we're faced with a choice do we want to believe in random chance or do we take on board that there is a creator who has made all these wonderful things we know the power inside the atom um, atoms are so small no one's seen one without a microscope you, they cannot be counted or weighed and yet inside that little atom there is the most incredible power contained but perhaps the most compelling example is DNA which has been unlocked in the last 50 years and this life code that controls our bodies that controls all the cells and the mechanisms of our bodies and how they work including a repair mechanism um, it's now so incredibly complicated that even the most ardent atheists have to admit that this could not come by random chance DNA of course is, is this combination of particular cells in our body or particular things in our body that um, are incredibly long um, and yet are incredibly placed in, the, in relation to each other like a chain inside that human cell every human cell contains three billion pieces of data and that's amazing um, that's equal to what you put in a hundred thousand books a two millimeter strand of DNA contains so much information that if transferred to CDs it would create a stack of CDs 160,000 kilometers high and it just it just blows your brain away to think that there is so much information inside one cell or one strand of DNA and it just shows you how incredibly complex the creation is the remarkable chain of atoms that create regulate life no wonder the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made and in the Hebrew that phrase for fearfully and wonderfully made is that we are woven together and now we're beginning to understand what God wrote in his Bible the remarkable program it creates and maintains and repairs cells so they have repair mechanisms when things happen in the body then the DNA goes into action and now that we know that most of the DNA has a particular purpose there was a time when people like uh, Richard Dawkins uh, used to say that there was the selfish gene and there was redundant parts of DNA well now they're finding that it all has a purpose in fact Richard Dawkins who's one of the leading skeptics and atheists uh, when questioned on television by John Lennox in a BBC debate said this that perhaps some space travelers planted the seeds of life and DNA on earth and so even the most ardent atheists cannot explain the complexity of DNA and the way it works inside the human body the human mind itself is an amazing thing we have reasoning power we have awareness we have abstract thought and worship creativity expression language and writing um, calculating powers imagination designing moral capabilities we can love worship apply reasoning we can apply God's character by choice 
we can overrule animal instinct by rational thought and we have an awareness of our mortality and we can hope for the things which may be better. So we have a, a very remarkable human mind that in so many ways is different to the mind of the animals. And that again is an evidence of design and creation. So moving on from the created things, which evidence that there is a God, and if there is a God, then you think that certainly the creator, if he's made this world, would let us know why and how we can participate in it. Well, when we come to the Bible itself, we're told in the second of Peter chapter 1, says this, but above all, remember that no prophecy in Scripture will be found to have come from the prophet's own prompting. For never did any prophecy come by human will, but men sent by God spoke as they were impelled by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible makes the claim that the words we have and the prophecies we have from the Bible were the direct influence of God through his power, the Holy Spirit. When we look at some of the things that we find in the Bible, for example, the Bible mentioned the ancient city of Babylon and a couple of centuries ago there was the high critics used to say that well Babylon doesn't exist it's never been found therefore the Bible is not reliable well Babylon has now been found in the 1920s um, it's been dug up and it, you can see the city exists exactly as it was described in the Bible and so again the Bible has been vindicated against those who sought to undermine its influence Scientific accuracy. The Bible is incredibly accurate. Uh, written two to three thousand years ago, we have these words in the book of Job uh, and the, in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah says that God sits on the circle of the earth, and yet, until about 400 years ago, most people believed the earth was flat, and yet the Bible said it was a circle. And that also in Job it says, God hangeth the world upon nothing. And so, the earth floats in space, not upon pillars, as people used to imagine uh, in their ignorance when we didn't have the observation from space. It says in the Bible that one star differeth from another star in glory. And so we have now, with the use of the Hubble telescope and other mechanisms, an incredible insight into the beauty and the diversity amongst the stars in heaven. And we get some idea that the Bible, again, was quite accurate when it said that stars differ in glory and we can see the different colors and structures of those star clusters. The water cycle, the book of Job talked about the water cycle, how that the sea covers the sea floor, that there was water drawn up by evaporation, trickling rain and mist, clouds delivering pouring rain, the bursting, the mounting up of clouds as we see in those areas that are subject to violent thunderstorms, the thundering in the heavens, the lightning, the snow, the light rain, heavy rain. The Bible describes the water cycle in great detail that we now fully understand. God made a challenge over 3,000 years ago when the book of Job was written. He said, have you entered the treasures of the snow or have you seen the treasures of the hail? And up until we got microscopes, we didn't have any idea what that was about. What was the hidden treasure of the snow? I'm going to put up for you now a little series, just a few clips of mic microscopical views of snowflakes. And you get some idea of the incredible design, incredible accuracy that you can see in a snowflake. All of them based upon six-sided hexagonal figures and not two ever been found to be the same design. And so you have these treasures of the snow. And when God challenged Job, he says, you haven't seen something I have seen. I've seen the treasures of the snow and you know some of these patterns are the most magnificent things and incredibly marvelous to see these patterns revealed to us of what a snowflake looks like under a microscope and as I said no two ever found to be exactly the same so the treasures of the snow the Bible knew something the writer of the Bible knew something that mankind did not then we read these words in the book of Job again, we have the question asked of Job, the, have you seen how the waters become hard like stone and the face of the deep is frozen? And we have this remarkable thing about the way water freezes and water can freeze at very, very low temperatures. But 
If the water froze completely solid, then all the life in those lakes would die. And of course it doesn't. And of course the remarkable thing is that the ice floats on top of the water and there are reasons for that in the varying temperatures. Remarkably, when water freezes, it actually um, enlarges itself and so it actually then floats on top and, and the life is preserved. The Bible had medicine correct. When you go through the, the law, law of Moses and other parts of the Bible, you know, God gave laws that were incredibly wise and beneficial, as we now know, from modern medicine. And most of the laws, in fact, all of the laws that God gave are now believed to be beneficial, especially in their cultural context that they were given. And things like um, isolation of disease, constant washing of body and clothes, avoiding, avoiding parasitic foods, and proper sanitation have all been shown in modern medicine to be extremely valuable. So again, the Bible had it right, and, and we make the obvious point that if the Bible was so accurate about things that it's taken the world centuries to come to understand, then it can only be done by somebody who made this creation and understands it perfectly. So leaving the, the witness of the accuracy of the Bible, for a book of its ancient times, it is incredibly accurate and therefore comes from a divine source. We could talk a lot about Bible prophecy because the Bible has precisely foretold many numerous events, events, some of them hundreds of years before they came to pass. And we know that no human can predict the future accurately. Only God can do that. So we see exact fulfillments of prophecy that have occurred. And we are therefore convinced that God is in control of these things that occur in our world. And we could talk at length about Israel and Babylon and Tyre and Egypt and Persia, which all had very precise fulfillments of prophecy. Today, we have prophecies about Israel and Russia and the papacy, all of them being fulfilled before our very eyes. But we're not going to spend a lot of time in Bible prophecy because, again, it's just our third witness to the accuracy of the Bible and the fact that we can trust the Bible. I want to come to the fourth reason that we trust the Bible, and that is the witness of the empty tomb of Jesus. Jesus was raised from the dead after three days and three nights. The apostles ran to the tomb. The women had found the tomb was empty. There's a very important case for the risen Jesus. The body was missing, which was remarkable because the Roman governor had put guards upon the tomb and his seal upon the tomb so that it was not to be disturbed. But the body was missing. Everybody knew that the body was gone. The heavy stone door upon the, the tomb had been moved when it was something that would take many, many people to do that. But it had been moved, obviously, by God. No logical explanation was ever given for the disappearance of the body of Christ. We know that what the Jews did was they bribed the soldiers to tell lies and the they actually covered it up as best they could. And once the gospel was preached and the apostles kept testifying that Jesus was risen, the Jews soon gave up their methods of trying to undermine the resurrection. So there was never a logical explanation as to what had happened to the body of Christ. The disciples, they got the blame initially that they had stolen the body and yet they had not expected he would rise from the dead. In fact, they weren't convinced that he was alive until some time after. What we do see about the apostles is that they were completely transformed in their courage and their conviction by meeting the risen Christ. And they amazingly then were able to stand up to the authorities to preach the gospel because they were transformed by meeting Christ after he came back from the dead. The scriptures had predicted that Christ would rise from the dead. And it happened exactly as they said. And Jesus had also said he would rise from the dead. So claims had been made that he would rise. This is the words of Psalm 16, verse 9 to 11. A messianic psalm, a psalm pro prophesying the work of Christ. And it says, Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For they will not leave my soul in the grave. You will not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That will show me the path of life. And it's remarkable that that's what 
the, the Old Testament had said would happen that Jesus would rise again on the third day. And so it came to pass. The fact that Christ is alive gives us assurance that God is still working in the earth and it gives us a cause to actually think about what God intends to do with us. The Apostle Paul preaching at Athens in Acts 17 gave us these words. Those times of ignorance God viewed with indulgence, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent, seeing that he has appointed a day on which before long he will judge the world in righteousness through the instrumentality of a man whom he has predestined to this work and has made the facts certain to everyone by raising him from the dead. And we take therefore great assurance and great conviction that the time is coming when God will mightily intervene in world affairs. He will judge the world in righteousness. The witness to that, the things that makes it certain is the fact that he has already raised Jesus from the dead. And that's the guarantee we have that God is still working and about to work even mightier in the earth. So the resurrection is an important guarantee for us. Remarkably, some people did not want to believe in the resurrection. One of those men, one of the men that was very much against the resurrection of Christ was a man called Saul, whose name was later changed to Paul. And as you probably know, Paul wrote much of the New Testament. Paul was an unwilling witness to the resurrection. He was willingly blind to the fact that Jesus had been raised from the dead. He opposed the apostles in every way he could. He arrested and tortured those who believed in Jesus' resurrection until himself came face to face with the risen Lord. And he then, after that, became a living witness to the Lord's resurrection. So unwilling witnesses also, besides those who were very glad to see Jesus alive, so we have plenty of evidence for the fact that Jesus was raised. The tomb was empty. No valid story was ever given as to where the body had gone. Jesus met the apostles, converted the apostles, converted Paul who was against him. And there are complete evidence that Christ was raised from the dead. So again, we have good reason to believe in what the Bible says in so many ways. The fact that Christ is alive, of course, gives us confidence that we can be raised from the dead when Christ returns. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20 says this, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. That little phrase, the last little phrase in that quotation, shows that we need to be in a position of being called Christ's followers when he comes back. You see, everyone in Adam that dies, that's every man who is descended from Adam, the first man, they, we all die. But not everybody's in Christ. You see, those that in Christ are those who will be raised at his coming. We need to take steps to make sure that we are, as the Bible says, in Christ. So there's some brief evidence as to why we believe the Bible is the word of God. We look out the, at the universe and the world in which we live and we see a remarkable creation. We look at the accuracy of the Bible and its internal evidence that it is written by a hand far beyond human education and knowledge at the time. We see the witness of fulfilled Bible prophecy and we have to face the, the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So all of those things give us great confidence to believe that the Bible is the word of God and can be trusted. Just a couple of quotations to finish with. This is from Weymouth's translation of Hebrew chapter 11 verse 1 and 2 now faith is a well-grounded assurance of that for which we hope and a conviction of the reality of things we do not see and while we can see so many things in the bible have come to pass there are many things yet to come to pass so we have a well-grounded assurance for believing the things which are yet to come to pass and for by it the saints of old won god's approval that's how we become accepted by god as we show faith and belief in what he has said in his bible Three vital Bible statements. 
Number one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is the most challenging opening statement of any book you'll ever read. It says there is a God and that everything you see around you was created by that God. In Hebrews 11 verse 6, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. There's the fundamental thing to being a servant of God and that God rewards those that diligently seek him. And then in Romans 10 verse 17, faith, that is belief, cometh by hearing. You know, faith is us choosing to believe and hearing comes by the word of God. So we must have that faith, we must have that belief and we will get that from the Bible, the word of God. So we leave this challenge with you. Where do we look for an explanation of the fact that we exist, the fact that the world exists, that the universe exists, and when we're facing up to the fact that we have a book that is far beyond human comprehension when it comes to how it was written so long ago? Well, this is the challenge of the First Corinthians 2 verse 5. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And we would encourage you to put your faith in the power of God, not in the wisdom of men. Thank you for listening, and we hope that you will follow through on these matters.